I'm going to mix things up a little bit today, but as we start, I uh, just want to open with a passage from St. Augustine's Confessions, since it is his feast day. Late have I loved you, O beauty ever ancient, ever new. Late have I loved you. You were within me, but I was outside, and it was there that I searched for you. In my unloveliness, I plunged into the lovely things which you created. You were with me, but I was not with you. Created things kept me from you. Yet if they had not been in you, that they would not have been at all. You called, you shouted, and you broke through my deafness. You flashed, you shone, and you dispelled my blindness. You breathed your fragrance on me. I drew in breath, and now I pant for you. I have tasted you. Now I hunger and thirst for more. You touched me, and I burn for your peace. You have made us for yourself, O God, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Hail Mary, full of grace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Alright, so we are going to pick up exactly where we left off last week. Again, last week we started out, we were talking about the Eucharist, and we hit as many of the passages as we could fit in one hour, Old and New Testament, that referred in one way or another to the Eucharist. This week we are starting out with um, just one passage. Uh, it's the whole chapter, John chapter 6. All right, there is a lot there. There's a lot there. And we're going to try and hit as much as we can in the first half hour or so. Um, kind of a little personal note, this chapter is hugely and personally important to me. On a very personal level, um, if it was not for this chapter, I might not be Catholic. Forget priesthood. This one chapter is a major reason why I became Catholic. People ask all the time, oh, why did you, and they find out I'm a convert, oh, why did you become Roman Catholic? So, well, the one word answer is Eucharist. The one sentence answer is the Bible made me do it. <laughs> Mostly this chapter. Although all the ones we were talking about last week, read in light of this, and read in light of what the Church teaches about the sacrament of the Eucharist, made it that much easier. So diving right into John chapter 6, I hope you guys read it, because we don't have time to read it here. It's size 10 font, single spacing, two pages. So we're not going to do that. And we, like I said, we just don't have time. If you look at your handouts, you will notice that I've basically broken the chapter into three major sections. Okay? I didn't pick out any individual verses because the whole thing is important. All right? but, so there's three main sections. You have the beginning of the chapter through about verse 21. Then you have the beginning of the Bread of Life discourse in verse 22 going up through about verse 50. And if you look in your Bibles, you'll notice that that's not where they usually end the section, but that's where the language that Jesus is using changes. So we're going to mark the separation at about verse 50. And then 51, and it says there 51 to 53, that's a typo. 51 to, I think it's 71, but whatever verse is the end of the chapter, I'm pretty sure it's 71. So, those are the three sections. One, verses 1 through 21, verses 22 to 50, and verses 51 to the end of the chapter, about verse 71 or so. Each of them kind of highlights a different thing. I have a couple other things there. The three major themes in John chapter 6. We'll listen out there. Okay, first, manna. Okay, this idea that the manna that comes from the multiplied loaves 
There's a connection with that and the manna in the desert in the book of Exodus. And they're both pointing to spiritual food and spiritual nourishment. Okay, so both the miracle and the manna in the desert and the bread of life that Jesus talks about are all references to, they all point to spiritual food and spiritual nourishment. Second major theme that's going on is that both the miracle at the beginning of the chapter and the bread of life discourse point to what we call as the messianic banquet. It's really it's kind of the fulfillment, the consummation of where all this is going. They both point to that. The third major theme, again written down here, is that the manna that Jesus is speaking of, okay, it alludes to what you know, biblical scholars and the people of Jesus' own day would have known as the wisdom feast. Okay, wisdom feast, right? And it's this idea, and we're going to talk more about this when we get to that second section of the chapter, of the very wisdom of God. And that the wisdom of God itself being food and nourishment for our souls. All these things are going on. Again, this goes with any time we're reading scripture, and any time we're doing exegesis, any time we're breaking down what we're seeing. Okay, exegesis, remember, is, is when we're looking at these passages in scripture and we're trying to make sense of them. But any time we're doing exegesis, but especially in this chapter here, make sure that we remember to look at the whole chapter as a unified whole. Okay? You say, like, oh, well, that's the first part. No, we're breaking down the sections because different things are happening, but the whole chapter is a unified whole. And we have to look at it that way. The whole narrative takes place in a certain way for certain reasons. Keep in mind a few things about the Gospel of John in general. First, who wrote it? Okay, it was the Apostle John. Okay. Saint John the Evangelist. The Apostle John, this is the same Apostle who rested his head on Jesus' chest at the Last Supper. It's the same John who was the only one of the twelve who made it all the way to the foot of the cross on Good Friday. It's the same John who was up on the Mount of Transfiguration. You could make a very complaint. It's the same John who Jesus entrusted his own mother to as he was dying. You could make a very compelling argument that John was Jesus' very best and closest friend during his life. That's who's writing this. That's the first thing to keep in mind. One of Jesus' best friends, if not his very best friend during his human life. He's the author. The second thing we have to remember, he's writing this after the other Gospels have been written. So by the time John writes his Gospel, it's probably 80 or 90 AD, probably close to 90 AD, or thereabouts. The other Gospels have been written, at least the ones that we still have. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which we call the Synoptic Gospels, have already been written down. So John, and we talked a little bit about this, he comes along later on, he's looked, so he already has the other Gospels. Excuse me, the coffee didn't go down the right way. Alright, so he already has these other written accounts. Of course there's the oral transmission going on, but he has the other written accounts. So there are times when he's going to write things a little bit differently, and it's not because he saw a different thing. It's like, okay, you guys already have three versions of that story. Let me give you the extra stuff that you didn't have. Let me tell you the other stuff that we talked about. And so, for instance, in his Last Supper narrative, John, alone among the Gospel authors, doesn't include the words of institution. The institution narrative, the, ones that, the words of the priest says every Mass, this is my body, this is my blood. John, alone, interestingly, doesn't mention that. Not because it didn't happen, but because by the time he's writing, it's like, you guys know that already. Yeah, in fact, there's three copies of it sitting over there. You guys have that. Let me tell you about the other stuff we talked about that night. Let me talk about when Jesus prayed for us. Let me talk about when Jesus talked about the vine and the branches. Let me tell you about when he washed our feet. And so he includes the extra stuff. And we're going to see that show up a little bit here, too. Alright? Again, I wrote this here. It's worth repeating. 
The bread of life discourse here in John chapter 6. Okay, so this whole homily that he gives in Capernaum, after the, starting the second section, going through the third of this chapter, takes the place of the words of institution. That's the other reason he doesn't include that in the Last Supper. It's like, you guys, I, we just finished talking about this a few chapters ago. I'm not going to repeat myself. But it takes the word, the place of the words of institution in the Last Supper narrative. It does not take the place of the Last Supper, obviously. He still talks about that. We have to remember that. Again, not because it didn't happen. He's like, I want to give you guys the other details of the stories that you haven't heard yet. Or the details that expand this story in new and exciting ways. And that, in fact, takes us to our first section here, verses 1 through 21. Right? And this is, if you will, it's a little bit of a background. It's the background of what's happening, setting the stage for all this. And right at the very, very beginning of all of this, in verse 4, John tells us that this was taking place at a very particular time in the Jewish liturgical calendar. What was it? It's near the time of the Passover. Hmm. Okay. Now, what does that mean? It means that at the time that this took place, Jesus was probably one year away from the Last Supper. Maybe two. We don't know if this is one year before or two years before, but this is earlier in his ministry. It could have been, in fact, almost to the day, a year before he was going to offer himself up, that this was taking place. But at any rate, it was happening around the same time. And that would have been a connection that the disciples and the early Christians would have immediately made. It's a connection that the Jews of his own time would have immediately made. That the Passover here, one of the next times he talks about the Passover, he's going to be talking about them gathering in the upper room. So right away, that's, that's a big clue of what he's talking about. It's also, however, a reference to the Exodus, right? Remember the first time we hear about the, the, the first Passover in Egypt? And there's definitely allusions to that. There's these kind of, there's this looking ahead to the Last Supper and a looking back to to the Exodus. And in fact, we're going to see that a little bit too because both the miraculous feeding of the 5,000 and the part where Jesus walks across the Sea of Galilee, that kind of reminds us a little bit of Exodus too, right? You know, where the Israelites cross the Red Sea to escape Egypt and then they miraculously are fed when they aren't near any cities and there is no food. And God miraculously feeds them with bread, right? And so it reminds us also of Exodus. And so we're thinking already of Exodus. <clears throat> between all of these things. And so Jesus is what? He's the one who's going to lead us in the new Exodus. The Exodus from sin. The Exodus from enslaving to sin and death and hell. So it's reminding us of that. Finally, I mentioned it there. This is the only miracle, as far as I know, I might have to double check that, but I'm, the last I checked, I'm pretty sure that the feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle that shows up in all four Gospels. Anyone think that's just a coincidence? Okay, I don't either. Because John didn't do coincidence. John was very, very smart. If he puts something in here, it's very intentional. John, you might say what you want about some of the other writers. John was very, very bright. He knew the heart of Jesus very well. He knew the heart of Mary very well. If he wrote something in here, he meant it. It wasn't an accident. So he includes this miracle. It's the only miracle that shows up in all four Gospels. And John wants us to know that this miracle happened around the time of the Passover. That's a very important detail for him. That's why he, should, he says, don't forget, this happened near the time of the Passover. 
So all that takes us, all that takes us to the second part. So now he's crossed, I just said the Red Sea, he's crossed the Sea of Galilee, he walked across the Sea of Galilee, Jesus says, and he's now in Capernaum, and he's teaching in the synagogue. So he's preaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. And he starts out with this beautiful uh, homily that we now call the Bread of Life Discourse. Now, many people, well, some theologians anyway, and many others have wanted to argue that all of this stuff that Jesus is saying is just very spiritual. Oh, he's, he's using spiritual language. It's a metaphor, it's a symbol, it's spiritual. Speech. Okay, look, it's like this. You could say that about the second section and the second section only. You can get away with saying that about verses 21 to 50. It's not a, or 22 to 50. You don't have a very good argument, but you could make an argument. You do, however, run into a few problems. And I've written a few of them down here, but some of those problems, see the big one is verse 23. So we don't have to get very far in the second section, verses 22 to 50. Second verse in that, verse 23, a word pops up, and I think the wording in the English translation, that the boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten bread after the Lord had given thanks. And the Greek verb used there, or the word used for where the Lord had given thanks, this might sound familiar, Eucharist Santos. Eucharist. Oh. Okay, so where the Lord had made Eucharist, made Thanksgiving. So that's already a little bit of a problem. If you want to say that none of this is Eucharistic at all, if none of it is Eucharistic, it begs the question, why did John use that particular word when he could have used another one? So that's your first little kind of problem with that. The other thing is that already this idea of breaking bread, by the time John's writing this at the end of the first century, the term breaking bread already also had very strong Eucharistic overtones that the early Christians who would have been reading this would have been picked up on and said, oh, that's a reference to the Eucharist. We're supposed to be thinking about the Eucharist right now because he's talking about bread and breaking bread. So even that is kind of a reminder of that. I said, if you look at verse 27 as well, all right, we'll read that real quickly. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Okay. Now, I said that your, that verse, and the verses around it, pick up on a theme that really you see expanded a little bit in the parts of the Old Testament, specifically in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 through 3, and in the Book of Wisdom, chapter 16, specifically verses 24, but I'll read a little bit around it too. First, Deuteronomy chapter 8, 1 through 3. This entire commandment that I command you today, you must diligently observe so that you may live and increase, and go in and occupy the land that the Lord promised an oath to your ancestors. Remember the long way that the Lord your God has led you these forty years in the wilderness, in order to humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commandments. He humbled you by letting you hunger, then by feeding you with manna, with which neither you nor your ancestors were acquainted in order to make you understand that one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Wisdom chapter 16, starting with verse 20, starting with verse 24 through verse 29. For creation, serving you who made it, exerts itself to punish the unrighteous, and in kindness relaxes on behalf of those who trust in you. Therefore, at that time also, Changed into all forms, it served your all-nourishing bounty, according to the desire of those who had need, 
so that your children, whom you loved, O Lord, might learn that it is not the production of crops that feeds humankind, but that your word sustains those who trust in you. For what was not destroyed by fire was melted when simply warmed by a fleeting ray of the sun, to make it known that one must rise before the sun to give you thanks, and must pray to you in the dawning of the light. For the hope of an ungrateful person will melt like wintry frost and flow away like waste water. All right, the big one there was, your word sustains those who trust in you. Okay, so again, there was, even in the first century, this kind of sense of the wisdom of God being food that you could eat and would nourish your soul. So something that the Jews would have kind of been a little familiar, they would have been familiar with this. And so some people have said, oh, well, you know, like maybe it's talking about that. Okay, maybe it is. Here's the problem. If you really want to make that a strong argument, you have to accept the Deuterocanon. In other words, all of the books that the Protestants like to call the Apocrypha. Because if you get rid of wisdom, you get rid of the Book of Wisdom, if you get rid of the wisdom books, it's a lot harder to argue that point. So the way I see it, maybe I'm exaggerating the problem here a little bit, but the way I see it, if you're going to say that the second section is supposed to be read in a spiritual way, then you have to accept the Catholic version of the Bible, or else your argument isn't very strong. Are you following how this might be a problem for the Protestant? You either have to accept that your Bible is insufficient, that the Catholic Bible is, has the correct version of the canon, the Old Testament canon, or you have to accept that this really isn't just a spiritual thing. So that's kind of a conundrum. And again, I might be exaggerating the problem a little bit, but it's there. Now, I would submit, because we're Roman Catholics and we're people of both hand, right? We believe in both faith and works, that God was, that Jesus was both divine and human. Um, we are both and people. I would submit that the second section can be read both spiritually and literally. And that that's in fact how Jesus wanted it to be interpreted. My argument for that is in the next section. So that final section then, John 6 verses 51 through 71, I think it's 71. Yeah, it's 71. Okay. Um, well, that's what we're going with. Here's why I think you can make the argument that it's both and. Right? Because he is using what you could say very spiritual language. He is making these allusions to the book of Deuteronomy and the book of wisdom. It's clearly there. But what happens next to me indicates that he didn't just mean it in a spiritual sense, the second section. Because right away, it's like verse 52 or 53, it says that a dispute broke out among them. Okay, you guys know what a dispute is, right? All right, so there's basically in the synagogue, right in the middle of this homily, they start arguing and fighting with each other. All of a sudden, our liturgies don't seem nearly so troubled anymore, right? They're actually yelling at each other across the synagogue, right in the middle of this whole thing. They're saying, this, is this guy for real? He can't possibly mean this, right? Does he really want us to eat his flesh and drink his blood? He can't actually mean that. Who is this guy? And we have to remember, because I mean, as, as horrifying as the idea of cannibalism is for you and me, we, we can't even really begin to understand just how appalling this would have sounded to a first century Jew. Like the idea of cannibalism, but also even just the idea of having any food with blood in it was absolutely forbidden. You could not do it. In fact, in the way Old Testament, I'm pretty sure it was like it was punishable by death. It was not by death, it was a certain way these months, it's like you cannot do this. 
it was absolutely forbidden to ever consume the blood of any living creature because they believed that blood was what gave life. You could not consume the blood of another living creature. It was absolutely for forbidden. You could not do it. So even just that would have been horrifying and disgusting to them. To add on top of that, this guy saying, no, eat me. Like, don't just drink my blood and eat my flesh. But no, you actually have to, like, eat me and be a cannibal. Absolutely horrifying to the listeners. And so they get really distraught by this. They're arguing and yelling in the middle of the synagogue. Here's the thing. If you're Jesus, and a shouting match has literally just broken out in the synagogue over something you said, over a misunderstanding, you think you might try to clear that up? If it was just, no, 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 guys, come on, it was a metaphor. Are we speaking symbolically? Oh, you foolish people, this, this faithless generation that doesn't know the book of wisdom or the book of Deuteronomy. I don't know, maybe that's in your Bible. It wasn't in mine. He doesn't make any comment about that. In fact, he ups the ante, doesn't he? He makes it worse. Before he was saying, okay, he, I don't remember the verb, he said he, but now he changes verbs. He starts using the Greek verb trogain. Right? This is a word usually used with animals. It's to, to munch or to gnaw or to chomp. You just really kind of chew and grind in your teeth. So you have to trogain my flesh. You have to chew and gnaw and chomp on my flesh or you don't have life within you. And now they really lose their minds. And he keeps saying it. Two or three times over the course of a few verses, he keeps using this really graphic, really kind of disgusting verb to describe the way animals chew and munch on their food. They say, no, you have to do that to my flesh. But you do not have eternal life. You have no life within you. If you don't chew and munch and gnaw on the flesh of the Son of God, instantly he's using the same word flesh that Paul is going to use later on. So you have to chew on my flesh. It's the same word that John uses at the beginning of the gospel. The word became flesh. And now Jesus is saying, you must chew on my flesh. But you have no life within you. You have to chew on it. You have to drink my blood. So now they're really, they've really lost it. Like, okay, we're out. And to be perfectly honest, who could blame them? I mean, we have 2,000 years of tradition, we have 2,000 years of history, we have catechesis. I look around the room, I imagine most of you guys were cradle Catholics, and so you grew up from an early age going to Mass and seeing people receive communion, and then you were taught how to receive communion. And I see some of the people here from RCA, and like I know even the conference, well, you guys have like a whole year of like heavy catechesis on this. And we're okay with it, and even so, we're like, oh, wow, you know, this is kind of a crazy if, you, if I think about it too much, but you know, I believe. Imagine if you've never heard anything like this. In fact, if everything you've been told so far is the exact opposite. Everything you ever knew about God was the exact opposite of this. Don't you dare drink blood. Don't you dare eat human flesh. And now all of a sudden this guy's like, hey, you gotta munch on me and nearly chomp down really hard and you don't get to go to heaven. You think that might go. Okay, like, I, I was with you when you fed us. I was with you when you healed that guy who's possessed by a demon. That was really cool how the blind guy can see now. Um, and I loved what you were saying on the mount about, you know, loving our neighbors and everything else, but I'm out. I can't take this. Cannibalism, I'm drawing the line here. I'm drawing the line at, at cannibalism and breaking every dietary law that I've ever been taught. So they do. 
It says a lot of his disciples get up and they leave. Here's the thing. His disciples got up and left. These were not the bandwagon followers who were just around because Jesus had fed them. They weren't the bandwagon followers. These were his disciples. These were the people who had been with him for a long time. And they said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And they got up and they left. Right in the middle of the synagogue service. We can't take this. If ever there was a time for Jesus to call, because remember, his disciples are the way, the crowds who would just kind of show up for the miracles and the shows, he didn't necessarily explain stuff to them. He explained stuff to his disciples. He explained it to them. So if ever there was a time where he'd say, whoa, 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 time out, stop, wait. It was only supposed to be interpreted spiritually or as an allegory. If ever there was a time that Jesus should have done that, it was right here. He says nothing. He watches them leave. In fact, then it says he turns to the twelve. You can almost kind of hear the sadness in his voice here. He says, Are you going to leave me too? And God bless Peter. Oh man, I love Simon Peter to death. Peter answers for all of us, doesn't he? He says, Lord, to whom else shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter doesn't understand yet. I think he's finally going to understand a year later when he's in the upper room. And Jesus picks up the bread and says, this is my body. I think he starts understanding then. He doesn't understand then. He doesn't understand right now. He says, I don't know where else I could go. You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Christ, the Son of God. You're it. So if you say that I need to chomp on your flesh like an animal and drink your blood, I hope you expand on that later and explain what you mean, because that sounds a little sick and gross and disgusting, and I'm kind of freaked out right now. But you have the words of eternal life, so I'll stick with you that far. So Peter answers for all the disciples who are left, and for us. To whom else are we, where else are we supposed to go? This is it. Again, remember I said that everything that John puts in here, he puts in for a very intentional, specific reason, right? And I meant to, to double check this. I'm fairly certain this is the first time, at least in John's Gospel, where we hear that Judas is the one who's going to betray Jesus. Let me say that again. This is the first time in the Gospel of John, immediately on the heels of many of Jesus' followers, his followers, leaving him. And this is the first time we hear about Judas' betrayal. I doubt that was accidental. I don't know if John is trying to make a connection between a lack of faith in the true presence on the part of Judas and his betrayal. That might be a stretch. I don't think it's very much of a stretch to say that he might be implying that some of the questions that Judas had stemmed from this. That a part of him kind of wanted to get up and leave too. Because he was like, I don't know if I can handle this. This is a hard teaching. This is a hard teaching. And it is, even for us today, isn't it? I'm a priest. I will pick up the consecrated host of mass and I look at it. Looks like bread. Smells like bread. In a couple minutes I'm going to verify that it still tastes like bread. All of my senses are screaming, Bread! I'm holding up that wafer, that, that host. And it's God. <laughs> I don't know how. It's a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And that's exactly 
exactly what the earliest disciples who left asked. It's a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And Peter, God bless him, gives us the answer. Here's the final nail in the coffin. And again, this is why I think that we can say that the second, again, the first, the first section gives us the context and sets the stage. The second section gives us two different ways of interpreting that portion where we can say there is the spiritual explanation going on and there's also this literal explanation. And then in the third part, the spiritual explanation kind of goes away. People who want to make that just spiritual say, well, Jesus just spent the last 25 or 30 verses where you could debate that he was speaking spiritually. Why would he keep doing that here with these much grosser and earthier verbs? So the third section, now he's done away with the spiritual talk. It seems to be this really gritty, earthy, you know, use of this, these terms. Really emphasizing the chewing, the gnawing, the consuming. Really making it very incarnational, if you will. Cool thing about John, this is one of the reasons I love his gospel so much. Anytime Jesus says something really confusing or weird or troubling, almost every time, John will say, Jesus was saying this to protect the manner of his death. Jesus was saying this because he was telling off the scribes and the Pharisees who were being stupid about such and such. Jesus was saying this because he was describing the blah, 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 blah. Jesus was saying this because he was explaining da, 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 da. Jesus was saying this because over and over again in his gospel, John will do that. He will add a little footnote commentary at the end of the passage. Jesus said this to talk about da, 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 da. Read the end of John chapter 6 closely. John chapter 7. Wait, 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 John, you forgot the part where you were saying, Jesus was saying this to describe the, you know, the spiritual metaphor of something or other. John's saying, no, I don't need to add anything. Jesus said it all. I'm going to let his words stand as they are. His words are good enough. I have nothing to add. Let's go on to chapter 7. And that really is it right there, right? Why? It's like, that for me, and I, I remember looking over this, and when that clicked in my brain, when I was still a Protestant, I was like, oh my goodness. John, hook a brother up, man. Like, you, you left out the part at the end where you explain what this is all about. And then I realized, that's because he doesn't need to. You don't need it. Jesus already said everything that needs to be said here. There's nothing more to add. And that was what Peter said, wasn't it? It's like, you have the words of eternal life, Lord. To whom else shall we go? So as we close with this part on the Eucharist, to keep that in mind, the terrible and awesome beauty of this sacrament that we do not deserve and we absolutely do not deserve it. We don't deserve to receive it. I certainly do not deserve to pick up a piece of bread and say, this is my body, and poof. Now it's not bread anymore. Who am I? Who is Father Mel or Father Laura or Bishop John? Who are any of us to be audacious enough to say a few words and then hold up something that looks like a piece of bread and say, hold it up to all of you and say, you guys better be worshiping this right now. Because God is in your presence. He's in our presence. How audacious. But it's true. And it's why we say that the Eucharist is the source and the summit of the Christian life. Brothers and sisters, if we forget everything else that we are ever taught, please let us never forget who is really present to us in the Blessed Sacrament of the Eucharist and what that shows us about the great love 
and humility of our Savior Jesus Christ. Because at the end of the day, nothing else matters, really. And again, I say, well, why did you become Catholic? They, they say, David, why did you become Catholic? Usually people ask me, yeah, Catholic, so they're calling me Father. David, why did you become Catholic? It was the Eucharist. Because I was given the eyes of faith, the scales fell off my eyes. I heard the words of Jesus preached at Capernaum in John chapter 6. I saw them in the light of everything we talked about last week, all these other passages throughout from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And I thought, oh man, oh no. I think they're right. I think the Catholics are right about this. I think that really is him. And I didn't need a pope or an encyclical or a council or a catechism or anyone to tell me to go to mass once I figured that out. I was a, I was a Protestant. I knew not to go up to communion, but I was a Protestant. I was like, if that's really Jesus, that's where I need to be on Sunday morning. That's where I want to be on Sunday morning because I get to be in the physical presence. I get to stand and kneel in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and to tell him, speak to him with my own mouth as he is in the room with me physically to tell him that I love him. To tell him that I'm sorry for my sins. To thank him for being present with me. I didn't need anyone to tell me to go to Mass on Sunday. I'd been going very faithfully for about five or six months before I even told the priest I wanted to become Catholic. It's like, if that's him, if that's really Jesus, everything else is gravy. Nothing else matters. It means the Catholics got the single most important thing right. They could have gotten the others, and I remember thinking, it's like, even if they're wrong about everything else, I didn't think, I didn't think the church was, so even if the church is wrong about everything else, it doesn't matter because they got the single most important thing right, and Jesus is inside their buildings on Sunday mornings. I didn't know the concept of daily mass at the time. <laughs> or blessed sacrament chapels, or anything else like that. All I knew about was Sunday mass and the Saturday vigil, so I was like, he's there. And if that's him, nothing else matters. And that's where I want to be. Well, make a kind of long story short, the next thing I knew, I was getting ordained after the years of seminary. <laughs> so, be careful with this teaching. It is a hard one to accept, but it's worth everything. Moving on with our last few minutes here, um, we'll try and hit Confirmation quickly. Now before we get to the uh, passages that you have there, I do want to talk a little bit of catechesis about confirmation. And we'll, we'll do a little bit of this with the next two sacraments as well. Um, actually, the remaining sacraments because uh, most of us, I think, have a pretty good idea catechetically about what's going on in baptism and the Eucharist. I think we get a little confused with some of the other stuff. And it's not anyone's fault. Um, so for instance, confirmation, and when, to be honest, I was a confirmation teacher, I used to teach it this way. I was like, oh, well, you know, this is like you getting to decide that you're gonna follow Christ on your own. Well, that's a problem, that's, that's not true. Well, not completely. The other thing is that's a very Protestant approach. Doesn't that sound a little bit like the sinner's prayer to anyone else? Okay. Um, and God bless them, I love our Protestant brothers and sisters. Most of my closest friends are still Protestants. We're not Protestant for a reason. And that's not what we believe about how grace works. The other problem is saying, oh, this is about you deciding that you're gonna follow through on the promises that were made for you in your baptism. Is that now who's the sacrament about? Oh, it's about me now. Wait, is the sacrament ever supposed to be about me? Uh-uh. The sacrament is never supposed to be about me. It is about God in me. 
It is about the work of God. Remember? That's what we said the first day. The sacraments are always the work of Christ. It's not mine. It's not me. And if I make confirmation about how I'm making a decision to follow Jesus, no, no, see, now you just made the sacrament about yourself. Can't do that. The sacrament is about Christ. It's about the work of Christ in your heart. Oh, but I get to choose. Here's the thing. You've been baptized. You've already done been chosen. You've already chosen. Okay, God picked you for His team. Okay, remember like I'm you know, on the, like the, the blacktop as a kid and you're picking teams and you say, okay, team captains, I picked David. They, they never did this right. I was never the first one. Except dodgeball. I was really good at dodgeball. Guess who dodgeball was like, all right, well, I picked David. Yes. Guess what I didn't get to do? I didn't say, well, I pick you back. Team Heaven like, I don't care. You're on my team. Get over here. We've been baptized. We've already been chosen. Right? Confirmation confirms that choice. It strengthens that choice. It reminds us of how we were chosen. And all the gifts that we received at baptism, all the grace that we received at baptism, those gifts of the Holy Spirit, guess what? You got them at baptism. Those gifts are now brought to full maturation. They are allowed to blossom. They are allowed to become what they were always supposed to be. It is God saying, remember when I chose you when you were a kid? Uh-uh, I was an infant. That's right, I know. I'm choosing you again. Confirmation is where God reaffirms that He chose us. It's where He looks at us in the eye and He says, I chose you before and I'm choosing you again and I will choose you for all eternity. You are mine. You are my son. You are my daughter. That's what's happening at confirmation. We don't choose God at confirmation. God chooses us again. He reminds us that we're, all, we, that we're His. It's good for us to keep that in mind. Like I said, I used to get that backwards too. I think, as a church, we don't do a very good job of communicating that. We get kind of mixed up and... Especially here in the West in the United States, we want to be all about freedom and choice and all this other stuff. Okay, that's a, there's a place for that. Confirmation isn't it. Confirmation, God, reaffirms His choice of us. I will right, quit beating that dead horse. But I hope, can, I hope you can remember that. Another thing I think this is a, maybe a better analogy to keep in mind when we're talking about confirmation is not so much the, oh, now we get to choose thing. Banish that motif as much as you can. Now, what it said is, like, think about the little child. Okay, when that child is born, when it's conceived, he already has inside of him or her a whole set of natural gifts and abilities. Okay. Think of Mozart. From the womb, had the potential to be a musical prodigy. Think of an athlete. That's a good example. Hmm? Oh, the same bowl. Okay, we'll use the same bowl here. The same bowl, when he was conceived, had in his genes the potential to be the fastest man who ever ran 100 meters. Here's the thing. Well, actually, maybe the same bowl isn't such a great example because he was kind of. He did, well, he did work hard. He did train very hard. But let's use someone else, okay? Like a Katie Ledecky, okay? We'll, we'll pick Katie Ledecky here because I'm a little bit more familiar with her story. Also because she's a workaholic. She trains really hard. Katie Ledecky had the potential to be the world's greatest long-distance swimmer when she was conceived. It was there. The gift was there. If she had never developed it, if she had never trained, Maybe if she jumps in the pool, she still would have dominated at every level that she was at, junior high, high school, whatever. She probably wouldn't have made it to the Olympics, though. She could have gotten by just on pure talent, just gotten and dominated at the high school level, and never would have made the Olympics. 
never would have been the greatest, one of the greatest distance swimmers, if not the greatest distance swimmer that most of us have ever seen in our lifetimes. She worked at it. Take Mozart, or maybe a more contemporary version, Adele. Musical talents there. The mind to be able to come up with songs there. If she decides that she is interested in that and decides to go practice photography 40 hours a week, instead of music, would she have still probably been, I don't know, one of the best singers in her high school choir? Probably. She'd become the incredible singer that she is today. Famous, world famous? Probably not. Okay? You think about something similar going on with the gifts that we receive at our baptism. They're all there. And we know, and Thomas Aquinas would say, that grace builds upon nature. So the gifts that are unique to you, 